So I'm here with Deepak Saxena and Arne Bergman, who are both members of the Kernel Working Group. I want to talk a little bit about um, basic enablement with you guys and new board port. So before I start, Arne, um, I know you run the Kernel Working Group, but what did you, where do you live and where did you work before you came to Lenaro? Uh, so I live in Portland, Oregon, yeah. and uh, before coming to Lenaro, I have about 10 years of experience working in the Kernel, specifically in ARM platforms. I worked as a Kernel maintainer in Monta Vista, and I worked on one laptop for a child for a while, and then at LPC. Yeah, at LPC, I was their Kernel maintainer. And then uh, I worked on some uh, IBI stuff. All right. So, Arndt, um, I know you work at IBM and you're German, but that's about it. So, tell, tell yeah. us more about the, the, the history. So, I'm, I've been working with IBM's Linux Techno Technology Center for about 10 years now. Um, I've worked on mainly the 390 and PowerPC architectures mm -hmm. and did some virtualization work. Um, I'm fairly new to ARM, although I did some of that before I, before I started working professionally for IBM. Mm -hmm. um, so this is all very new to me, but I've had a good, uh, I, I learned a lot over the last one half years and I've come to be the, the maintainer for all the new platforms getting merged and all the, uh, all the board files, all the uh, platform specific and SOC specific code goes through my source tree now. All right, that's good, that's exactly what I want to talk to, to you guys about. So what I know is that there's a lot of ARM SOC code out there, out there. Um, that is out of tree that has never been merged into Linux. And based on what we talk about, you know, when we discuss it and do our reviews, we know that a lot of it has been done the wrong way. And so what I wanted you guys to cover is like, what's the right way? If I'm, if I'm gonna bring out a new SOC and there's nothing in the kernel tree, and let's talk about that case first. I think it's, it's, it's one of the cases that are important. So if there's nothing in the kernel tree that supports that SOC today. Where do I start? What should I do, which is important? Well, first of all, uh, one needs to understand where we are heading with the, with the platforms because we are currently in the middle of reworking the whole way that platform specific code interacts with the architecture code. Okay, so what's the plan? Where, where are we going? We are um, moving from a, from a situation where every SOC has its own subdirectory yeah. and is built standalone to a situation where you can build any combinations of um, SOCs from about the same age together in one big kernel that has a lot, lot of different impacts. We also have, we are also in the, in the process of um, changing the boot model fundamentally and we also try to move device drivers into their, into subsystems containing the whole class of similar device drivers across SSCs. Right, so you have a one device driver that's just factored out. Yeah, so traditionally um, a lot of the platform specific device drivers we're living in a platform specific directory. Right. There's also um, been a time when device drivers were living in, in a bus specific directory. So a USB driver would live together with other USB drivers for different things. Right. And we're moving to, to a model where um, all the similar drivers live in one directory together. Functionally, right? Functionally. So for example, yeah. pin control drivers would live in one directory, interrupt controller chip drivers right. live in one directory, keypad drivers live in one directory, and so on. Right. So we're doing a lot of this work um, sort of framed around the idea of using device tree for description initialization, right? So how does that work? What's the, what's the big change? And when I'm writing a new SOC, what should I do? As in a big change from what we're doing right now? From, from, from how it was done in the, how it's done in the past. Okay, yeah. so, well, technically, you know, how the kernel has booted before is basically the bootloader passes the the kernel is just a, little, a number that says this is the machine I'm on, and then there's a lot of hard coding in there mm -hmm. for different devices on the platform. Right. So we'll hard code this device on this address, this device on this other address, and um, what, that's what, what the device tree does is moves that all out of the kernel into a separate file that in the long term will actually make it easier for new platforms to be brought up. Right. Because if you're doing a new SOC port that already has some drivers from an existing SOC in there, yeah. and the driver already has device tree support, all you need to do for the new board port for new SOC bring up is say, well, in my device tree file, I have this device at this address with this IRQ and this set of registers. And it could be different for a, di for a different board. It right? could be different for a different board, yeah. Right. So to summarize what you guys have just told me then, one thing which is important is to put the drivers in the right place and look, and look at that functional location to see if there are other drivers which are similar to what you're doing. Yes, and we've had the case a few times that we have multiple drivers doing the same thing and people didn't know that they existed because they were just looking at their own directory. So the, the idea behind this is that 
you can see if any other driver is similar to the one you're writing, so you just extend it the way you need, or you just use it. Use one that's already there. All right. And the second part of that is use device tree to describe the board instead of uh, relying on machine ID being supplied and then doing everything statically in the board. Mm -hmm. files, right? mm -hmm. Correct. So the point for that is that inside of one platform, you can support an arbitrary number of boards, even those that have not been made yet, just by adding the description that says where all the devices are. Right. If they're logically organized in a, in a similar way, then it should work. Yes. So if the, if the whole platform, mm -hmm. if there's only one board made with this one SOC, yeah. then we don't gain anything. But if we get to the point when there are three or four or ten or a hundred different boards made with the same SOC. Which is often the case, right? Yeah. yeah. Then, then we can just abstract this with the device tree. So you, you need to describe only the common parts and you have the device drivers, but the location and specifics of the devices are all passed from external bits of data into the current. Okay. So apart from those two things, which are good general guidelines, what are the things that people should watch out not to do or to do in a specific way? So one of the things um, I've seen a lot over the years is um, when writing device drivers to really try and find commonality. So, so first thing, you know, look to see if there's another device driver for this IP block already. You yeah. know, in the arm world, that's, that's a fairly common thing. But a lot of times what happens, um, especially for someone who's new to, new to working on Linux, yeah. is, well, I'm gonna, I have to write a device driver for this function, and they just take this attitude of, well, I'm going to go write this whole stack. You know, I've seen code, even, even code these days, not like five years ago, code yeah. these days, where, oh, I'm going to go write a whole I2C stack because I've got an I2C device I need to talk to. So really trying to understand how the kernel is architected, understanding um, where different drivers need to live, and understanding what are the commonalities between my driver and other drivers that may already exist. Because when there's new hardware coming out, a lot of times it's easy to jump to this conclusion of, well, I've got this feature and no one else has this feature, so I need to go do something very specific. But the reality is? The reality is that if you've got this feature, chances are all your competitors are going to have this feature or they already have this feature and they're already working on it behind behind closed doors. Or some people have it in tree already. Right, or someone, or someone has it on tree already. So really trying to understand like, what's happening in the community, who's working on what features, and really reaching out, you know, reaching out to the community and saying, hey, I've got this feature, and I'm wondering if anyone else is already working on it, if people have already thought about this. You know, if you're not ready to go, to go out to the community yet, because, okay, it's really early on in your development cycle, and you're, you know, for whatever issues, you're not willing to reveal what your features are, that's a place where Lenaro can actually help. You can come to Lenaro and say, okay, we're working on this, we're not sure what's happening out there. Can you guys guide us? Right. Mm -hmm. What else, Art? What else so the, should people watch? The, the hardest part, of course, is when you're writing a device driver yeah. for some hardware that no one else has even seen before. Like you, your company has come up with this great new feature, and that's mm -hmm. you put that in your SOC, and you, then you want to do a device driver for it. Yeah. Designing a user interface for a process to talk to the kernel. That's the hardest part, mm -hmm. and you need to uh, make sure that you spend enough time designing that interface right, talk to the upstream kernel people very soon in the process about how the device should actually interact with user space because otherwise, when you try to get it upstream, you will have to, to end up um, redoing any, everything. Or even if you plan not to do it upstream, what could happen is that your competitors um, later come up with a similar driver, right. get that upstream, and suddenly you've got a whole software stack uh, built around your competitor solution and it doesn't work with your driver anymore. Give me an example of a driver which was done the right way, something, somebody that did something the, the right way there in, in negotiating. Um, what that interface should look like, and so on. Um, and I know you've most, seen lots most, of most people do it wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you, it's it's very hard for for some new functionality to be done the right way. We we just have one uh, big subsystem coming in. That's the industrial I/O subsystem I -O, yeah. uh, that encapsulates um, a lot of different I/O devices. Mm -hmm. um, it has actually been around for a long time, but it's only now trying to get into the upstream kernel. It's right now in the staging area of the kernel. Mm -hmm. They're trying to clean it up. Um, but still we see people pushing their own implementations of, for example, an analog digital converter or a, um, LED or something that, that has a subsystem like industrial I.O. in the kernel. Um, so the right way is to look what's coming next and work with those people. Or if, if there's something similar, then you can Try to work with them, see if if you can make if you can model your subsystem to, to look like that. Right. What else? Do you well, so you know, I'm no longer a kernel developer; I'm a manager. So putting on a manager hat, you know, something that's really important for managers to understand when you've got engineers working and bringing a new SOC up, is making sure they've got the time to interact with the community. 
You know, it takes time to be out there, to be researching, to be on a mailing list, to be reading these threads and understanding, okay, what are the issues people are running into when they're trying to bring in this new technology? Because you may say, okay, I want to bring in, you know, support for this new piece of hardware, and that may start off a whole other third conversation around some other issues in the kernel that you need to deal with before you can actually bring in the support for this piece of hardware. And that's something that um, engineers, to have, engineers need to have the time to do. And a lot of times there's this pressure, well, you used to get our thing working and then we'll worry about it later. But that ends up creating... But you do worry lot. about it later. You right? do worry about it later. <laughs> it, 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 and if you do worry about it later, you end up creating a lot more work because you've now got this, like Aaron said, you've got the software stack you now have to change. And you now have to take the engineers that you kind of want working on the next generation product, but now they're stuck with this old code that they now have to go clean up. Right. And... Um Another important point is picking your examples. So most of the code that's getting introduced, they, people copy code from, from other places because that's the only choice you have. Of course. Um, but the a very common mistake is to copy code from something that looks like it's fairly uh, widely used and that everybody knows how to work with. Uh, but that's not the, not the best approach usually. So in, in a lot of cases, uh, the code that's getting the most use is also the one uh, that has the most special case legacy baggage and, and mm -hmm. all the special cases. Yeah. Um, so my recommendation for that is to always take a look at uh, within the group of similar things, which one was added last because the chances are that this went through the most rigorous review before getting it into the kernel. That is true on, on three different le levels. Uh, the first one would be adding a new board file yeah. in, in one platform and actually uh, when, you, when you look at what's going on there, we don't add board files anymore, as we talked about, we would add a new description for the device tree. Yep. The second one is adding a new sub-architecture inside of the ARM architecture. We've had a few that got added very recently. Um, we did very exhaustive reviews because we knew there would be more people coming. Yep. So they are very cleanly implemented. Right now that's the uh, Primer 2 platform from Surf. And then there's the high bank from um, Kazida, yeah. and a few a few others. And there's always whenever you want to look at adding another one, look at the last one that got added, or the last two or three ones, and then take the best of all of those. How can people tell which one of the last ones that were added? Um, in the Git history, so the Git history, Git log, and other Git commands are very very helpful resource for this. And right. Um, everyone working with the upstream community should really know a lot about using Git and how to get information out of it, how to work with that, because that's very essential for, for interacting with the community later yeah. and, and knowing what, what other people have done in the past. Right. And the, the third level, coming back to, to these three things, would be adding a new architecture. Right. Um, we're, about, we're roughly adding one architecture per major kernel release right now. Mm -hmm. So the last four kernels each of them got a new architecture. The latest one was the Texas Instruments C6X, um, which has been around for a really long time. It's a DSP, right? Yes, it's a DSP. Yeah. And that is now upstream. We will soon s probably see two new architectures implemented in FPGAs, very mm -hmm. simple, uh, small architectures, even without MMUs. Um, so if you always look at the latest one that got added, that's usually the best example. And so if I'm doing a new V7 architecture, uh, sorry, new ARM V7 based SOC today, what are the good ones to look at? So you mentioned um, Calcita High Bank. Mm -hmm. The, the yeah. Prima 2. Prima 2, yeah. Um, and there's the, um, what's that? There's a FPGA based one from Xilinx. Um, I'm really bad on that. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you reviewed them, huh? I, 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 and don't ask me who, who wrote it, <laughs> yeah. because I, I met them all, but... <laughs> <laughs> um. All right, but those are good examples yeah. already. All right, guys, thanks very much for the time. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers.